And then I'd also like to welcome everybody. Um, and don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, going through this, but we have a uh, digging deeper into the ethical use of learning analytics. We have uh, Linda, Hazel, and Stretchko, and I believe uh, I'll go ahead and just turn off, uh, turn over to you. Um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them into the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Justin and George. I will just uh, I will ask Hazel to get us started while I share the participant information sheet and the consent form because we uh, we envision this as a more hands-on session where we're gonna do the first time intro into some of the problems in with uh, ethical and use of learning analytics, and then we would ask you to reflect on that as well. So let me just share the the those two links in the chat and Hazel. Uh, Please go ahead. Thank you. So if you can just move one slide forward. So Linda, Shreko and I um, are basically the learning analytics SIG leadership group for Ascolite. And for those who aren't aware of what Ascolite, Ascolite is the Australasian Society for Computers in Learning and Teaching in um, Higher Education. Um, so, an Australasian but also international association. We have a group of eight different SIGs at the moment, and the Learning Analytics SIG has now been going for, I think it's about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, probably about seven years. And um, the three of us have been the leadership group for the last couple of years. Um, there's been changes along the way. But this year we decided that we wanted to look deeper into the idea of ethical use of analytics and taking it to the practical level as well as the theoretical and research level to um, have a lot of impact with the Ascolite membership. So we've developed this series, Digging Deeper, and we started off at the beginning of the year with a, an asynchronous discussion amongst the Ascolite SIG members. Um, on recommendations out of a discussion paper. Um, and Linda will give you more details of that paper later. Um, we then had an expert panel webinar where we had perspectives on this issue from a researcher, um, a practitioner and an industry representative. And now we move to today where we're going to have a bit of chat and then get you to give us your opinions of where we're at we're going to follow this up with another workshop for the Ascolite SIG and finish off with um, a conference session, hopefully at our conference, whether it's face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or more likely the way we're going um, online only. We still got a couple of months to determine where that will end up. Um, and just to note that anybody can be a member of the Ascolite SIG, so if what we're doing um, is something you're interested in, we'd love to welcome more members along all the time, and anybody is also welcome to join Ascolite as a member as well. So Linda, over to you. Actually, I believe we're going to go over to Shreko first, uh, who's going to yeah. take us through the <laughs> <Okay. laughs> policies and payments. So just, just, to, um, just to give everybody a little bit of background, actually, um, around what we are going to do today, we, we're going to show you a little bit about sort of the background of, of where we've come from, the sorts of things that have inspired our thinking in terms of where we think the discussions around the ethics of learning analytics use, especially in practice, um, have come from. Uh, we're going to talk about the discussion paper that Hazel spoke about before, which has a very sort of Australian lens to it, but I guess probably isn't all that Australian. I think we could really say that it could be used pretty much anywhere. Uh, and then <laughs> Shreko is going to take us through, oh, Shreko, you're back on your email. Um, yep. <laughs> Shreko is going to take us through um, some of the more practical uses of learning analytics. And that will sort of give us a little bit of an inspiration to do an activity towards the end where we want to really delve, delve as Hazel said, which is called the digging deeper into the uh, ethical use of learning analytics. So we want to um, have a look at some of those day-to-day -day uses of learning analytics and the sorts of ethical issues, considerations that they throw up for us as practitioners, as researchers, as teachers. So Shreka, I'll pass over to you to have a look at uh, the kinds of policies and frameworks that have informed this thinking. Give me just a second, please, so I can actually pause the sharing for a moment. Okay. 
Uh, apparently, okay. people uh, look uh, uh, are trying to reach me when they are not supposed to. So I'm just going to kill all the communication oh, okay. in the background. It <laughs> no might problem. be a better way to deal with this. Hey, Swish, just a heads up that yep. I was having trouble accessing the Google Drive. The uh, which one? That may be where you're getting some requests coming yeah, in. The one that the one that you shared, Srechko, yeah. When I, I have to yeah. click, I have to click uh, request access. So it's been restricted. Uh, for the for the first one or the second one. First one. Yeah, the, the one Google one. Drive. One, That's oh, just, the information uh, just, Yeah. Let me just get that link again. So restricted. Anyone with the link? Just a moment. <laughs> I'll share that again. Well, apologize for the technical problems. Okay, now it should work. Lovely. So as uh, as Linda said, I will just give you a brief overview of some of the uh, previous work, right? I, I'm sure I will miss most of the important references, so my apologies in advance. And uh, I will try to be organizing quick as, as, as uh, we wouldn't spend a lot of time on this and so we could get to the practical session uh, faster. Uh, so back in, in, in 2013 and 2014, uh, two important set of policies emerged in work by Slade and Prinsloo and as well Pardo and Siemens. So both of those set of policies test the potential of learning analytics to collect detailed information about how students learn, providing means for changing how learning experiences are conceived and how uh, analytics ca uh, can be deployed. So learning analytics basically was about to change the world we knew at the time. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they also highlighted that ethical and privacy issues derived from these new uh, possibilities are not being properly addressed. Although there are certain differences between the two policies, as you, as you, as you can see, both highlight the importance of student agency, transparency, and accountability. So Slade and Prince will further discuss uh, uh, learning analytics as, uh, as a notion of moral practice, saying that the focus should not always be uh, on what might be effective, but on supporting decisions about what is appropriate and morally necessary. Uh, the ultimate goal, uh, according to, to Slade and Prinsloo, uh, is not necessarily about measuring, but more about understanding. Uh, this is also reflected in Pardo and Siemens' notion of accountability and assessment, where assessment has been viewed as the responsibility of the institution to constantly evaluate review and refine the data collection, security, and transparency. So these principles, as you will see, have been addressed in the work that, that, that followed uh, later on. So the Open University uh, in the UK was arguably the first institution to develop a, a policy on ethical use of student data for learning analytics. So this policy uh, aimed at uh, setting up a framework for ethical use of student data and uh, at, the, at the open university. Being an open university and communicating with students online all the time may kind of um, it makes sense that uh, that uh, the, uh, the policy emerged from this institution at the time. So and the idea was to shape the student support provided uh, following the principles outlined in the policy. So core organizational principles responsibility, transparency and trust, as well as students' involvement as uh, active agents are some of the most prominent dimensions identify, identified within these um, proposed principles. In addition to the principles discussed in the Open University Policy, JISC, again, another institution out of the, of the UK, uh, uh, released a code of practice for learning, learning analytics, where they further introduced the importance of data validity as being essential for developing robust and reliable learning analytics models. And that was one of the important steps in, in, the, in the discussion of policy and privacy. The, the, the notion that they actually uh, understood the importance of data validity for, um, for developing robust learning analytics models. And of course, we can't really talk about um, privacy and ethics in, in a learning analytics space without the delicate checklist introduced by Drashler and Geller back in 2016. This is probably the most referenced work in this area. And although based around a similar set of, of uh, ethical and privacy concerns, the delicate checklist further introduces the, important, uh, the, the importance of providing technical procedures to guarantee privacy and the necessity to consider external providers in dealing with learning related data. So here we already uh, start to talk more about 
data privacy and ensuring the data privacy and, and sharing data between different institutions. Leah's box further represents a data protection frame. So it basically comprises, is comprised of a set of eight principles for ensuring ethical treatment of personal data in learning analytics platform and, and, and services. So the focus uh, here gets more specifically framed around data protection, and data privacy. Taking more, uh, talking more about uh, the, the, the technical implications and implementations, right? So the, the set of the principles proposed in this data protection framework includes data privacy, purpose and data ownership, consent, transparency and trust again, access and control, accountability and assessment, data quality, as well as data management and, and security. So the more data, data we had, it became more important to develop various protection and privacy legislations are on various levels. So here, and especially on this slide, we're not talking about education institutions only, but worldwide across different institutions and, and different levels. As you can see here, there are very few countries without any data protection legislations in, in 2020. There were actually very few countries without data legislation back, back then, a year ago. However, having a legislation or a policy in place does not really solve all our problems. Brown and, and Klein analyzed 151 university policy statements to identify hidden assumptions, silences, and unintended consequences related to those, uh, to those policies. One of the major issues is that the primary goal of the existing frameworks uh, is driven by intention to protect institutional liability and reducing potential risk where data are being treated as a static artifact. More importantly, students are being uh, positioned as informed agentic partners in the education. As, uh, as Brown and Klein uh, further, further discussed, it is unclear how these policies address individual student needs. There is obviously striking tension between how data systems are being often conceptualized as static, but then we also try to enact them as dynamic technology. So we say we're gonna provide, for example, personalized feedback and, and uh, personal learning graphs, but we still treat data as conceptualized data as static artifacts. So there was a, there, that was one of the terms identified in, the, in their work. So although all those frameworks have been essential in establishing a strong agenda for ensuring uh, student privacy, there was a need identified to extend towards more um, practical solutions that would allow for the authorization of, of existing policies. So we have policies, but we don't have really practical solutions how to put those in, in, in place. So in an attempt to, to progress more, uh, how to say, more demonstrable uh, process, Hall and colleagues provide an extensive list of the requirements that should represent the essential component of any learning analytics architecture. So they also discuss privacy by design as an essential uh, feature of uh, any learning analytics solution. So they actually go more towards, okay, this is what educational technology solutions should put in place in order to, uh, to uh, ensure stu uh, student privacy. And uh, two, among others, I, I will just reference two, um, I, I would say most um, recognized architectures that emerged at the time. So one of them was uh, from uh, Chris Brooks and uh, Ryan Baker's lab, uh, Morph, the framework that actually allows you to share uh, not necessarily uh, data itself, but results of the analysis. So there is this nice, uh, very well-developed um, uh, repository with all the data, and all you have to do is to write scripts and, and get your results. So what they did basically was really good in the sense that uh, uh, you kind of you, you avoid sharing data between institutions and you allow for learning analytics research and practice to scale up but you don't have to share data and to uh, uh, handle all the privacy and data sharing issues so everything sits in one place and then one organization is responsible for protecting the student data all you have to do all you uh, you have to do is to write your scripts do your analysis and get your results Hillman and Ganesh, on the other hand, propose a system uh, called Kratos that provides students uh, and schools uh, uh, a log data along with comprehensive access to data that is otherwise 
sold across systems and, and vendors. So the main idea behind Kratos is framed around the necessity to integrate data across a wide variety of educational platforms developed by different vendors that are being used in, in K-12 setting. This was slightly different. While Morph was focused on MOOCs, uh, this was more in the K-12 space. And finally, just a little bit on some of the work that, that we are doing here. Uh, what we are trying to develop is, again, uh, um, established in the notion of privacy by design. Uh, we are trying to develop uh, a synthetic data set based on the original data, synthetic data set that can be shared, but also uh, has all the properties that the original data set has. And I'm happy to talk about this more, but I think we're running out of time. So as you can see, uh, the whole, starting from 2013 to, to nowadays, we developed an, a nice set of principles and policies and frameworks that were supposed to be in place by now, but it seems like that the more we did, the, uh, we went more towards protecting data and not considering other ethical and privacy concerns. And I think that's what Linda will talk about. Lovely, thanks Reko. Sorry to, uh, to just uh, take us on a, on a slight tangent here, but uh, some of you may know I was having a bit of trouble getting into the webinar today and we always have technical issues with things like the information sheets. Um, but just as Shreko was presenting there, we've just had a minor earthquake in Melbourne. <laughs> So, which is where I am right now. So I apologize if I looked a bit strange on screen for a moment there, but the whole place was shaking. Um, so yeah, the things you don't expect to happen in the middle of a webinar. All right, um, anyway, moving on. So I think, thanks Reko. I think you um, have given us a really interesting overview there of all the sorts of the thinking and, and the, the kind of attempts that have been happening in this, uh, this space. And I guess that like all good things that come out of the learning analytics community, I believe, um, we actually created a, a document for the, the Australasian context um, of, of a conversation that happened in a pub. And I say that I wasn't actually in the pub at the time, but um, other people were, and certainly the people who are listed on this document. And the, the, the people involved in this particular piece of work come from across different Australian universities across different states. And we came together to really say, how does all, all this stuff that's going on in the world, all of these wonderful discussions, the great research minds, the really interesting policy perspectives, how do we distill that down into some sort of guide that would be really helpful for us here in the Australian higher ed context? Not only for teaching staff, but also for senior administrators, for learning analytics specialists, and all the people, learning designers, all the people um, in between, who have to deal with this data on a sort of daily basis. And so what we did is we created um, this particular discussion paper, not to sort of mandate anything, or it was more a recommendation of how institutions and staff within in institutions might start to think about how this sort of thing works in practice. It's all well and good to have a policy, but again, if you're not really engaged with that policy, if your staff are not aware of the policy, then it sort of doesn't really serve its purpose. So there are a number of principles and, and Shreko's looked at a lot, a lot of different um, frameworks there and, you know, from Slade and Prinslow's work through to the delicate framework, there are lots of different things that people have highlighted as being important. And this document tried to do sort of a similar kind of thing there. So Shreko, there's a couple of um, animations on this slide. So if you want to start to bring the principles up. So one of the things that we often talk about first is privacy. So the idea of privacy is very, very important. You know, we legislate for privacy and it's, it's sort of, I guess, one of the easier of the um, the principles for us to, to think about because there's, I think, been a sort of more established history of privacy law and, uh, and how we deal with privacy as institutions. But we felt that there were some other things that really needed to be encapsulated in these sorts of policies and guidelines given to staff in universities. So, Shreko, the next one. Do you want to just actually bring them all up and we'll, we'll go through them quickly because I'm conscious we want to get into our activity as soon as possible. So, again, these are not a million miles away from some of those uh, frameworks that Shreko has just shown us before. But we thought that there really needs to be a lot of work around the kind of data ownership and control. Um, who owns the data? Is it the institution? Is it the student? Is it the vendor? You know, there are lots of those sorts of discussions that need to, to take place. And again, we also need to let people know who has that ownership. And it's a very slippery. I tried to write a paper with some friends, um, uh, colleagues a, a few years ago, and we really got into a, a whole ethical and legal 
minefield trying to kind of really make this simple for learning learning analytics practitioners. Transparency, big one, letting people know what's going on, what the systems do, what data we're collecting, what we're doing with that data. Um, consent, of course, is, is a huge one that, um, you know, we, we really still, I think a lot of institutions are grappling with how they um, manage to get consent, but also how that consent can be informed consent. Um, anonymity, uh, we've got the, the long words that I'm really bad at saying, non-maleficence and beneficence, I think. Oh, I'm terrible at those ones. But anyway, data management and security and access. So I'm doing a study at the moment where I'm talking directly with, with learning analytics, uh, well, with, with teaching staff around the idea of learning analytics. And so much of it just comes down to access. So forget privacy, forget data ownership, forget all those other things. It's just just what data can I actually see that can I actually get my hands on and do something with? So this was really the paper that kicked off what we've been calling the Digging Deeper into the learning analytics, uh, into the ethics of learning analytics series. And we put that out there and we um, asked people to have a bit of a conversation around that. And it was really interesting because people were bringing up really key day-to-day -day uses of learning analytics and saying, how does this fit with the kinds of principles and policies that um, that we're proposing through these different things. So we're gonna, again, I'm just laying that as a seed for you to have a bit of a think about how you might be using analytics in your own practice, whether that be in a learning design role or in a teaching role or in a policy uh, development role. Um, and I'll, I'll lay that seed while I pass back to Shreko, who's gonna talk to us a little bit more about some of the applications that we see of learning analytics in higher education at the moment. Thanks, Linda. So I don't think I will say anything uh, only too novel here because uh, I'm sure if you have been in learning analytics field at least for the last two months, you would have uh, read about uh, some of those applications. So uh, everything, I guess, most of these institutions would develop all kinds of different dashboards. And if you can't see uh, this dashboard very clearly, that's on purpose because it, the idea was just to give you a big picture of what are the, some of the things out there. So usually those dashboards, as, as Linda said, uh, are not uh, um, necessarily derived based on what we want to see, but mostly what kind of data we have access to. And usually these are some kinds of uh, counts of clicks, how many times we watch the video, how many times we, uh, we uh, post it to discussion forums and so on. Uh, then again, uh, social network analysis has been one of the cornerstone, cornerstones of learning analytics research. But somehow uh, through, uh, through years, we uh, moved from understanding who talks to whom to uh, basically analyzing you know, what are the topics we talk about. Uh, it's not so that at that point, it wasn't just social network analysis. It was more like network analysis. And I would like to say thank to thanks to uh, Sasha Poquet for this, uh, this graph that represents different concepts and how these are linked in the, in the little and high vocabulary overlap. So I won't be going to details of that study. Uh, but basically what we did, we used a network uh, uh, approach to analyze uh, text that characterize different learner engagement. Uh, you also, uh, you might have heard of epistemic network analysis and other um, uh, a network based analysis that allows us basically to integrate that uh, social and, uh, and I would say cognitive aspect of interactions in different um, whether it is a discussion forums or, or uh, email communication or whatever uh, the in, uh, interaction between participants might be. And uh, of course, from uh, Simon Bucking and Sham uh, Lab, ACA Writer, a learning analytics tool for formative feedback of academic writing. There are many, uh, well, there are not many tools like this one, but uh, text analytics and text mining is also one of the ways we apply learning analytics and one of the ways we uh, use to analyze student data. Uh, not that side, this side. And of course, predictive analytics and intervention. Once we have data, who did what, we are trying to understand what are the factors that help us, uh, um, uh, that help us understand who are the students who might be failing a course, who are the students that, who need more help. And in that sense, we are actually using all kinds of different data from mostly from from uh, uh, logs to predict uh, where each of the students is standing and how we can actually help them navigate throughout the course. With uh, development of multimodal learning analytics and uh, 
I, I would like to thank Daniela Dimitri for, for this slide. Uh, we kind of got more and more data about students, students and uh, about learning from different modalities using different sensors. So it's kind of, it, it became much, much, uh, we got a more rich data and uh, we could do way more. But sometimes it's it, it, going back to slides and principles work, uh, whether something is ethical, so should we do something just because we can? Like one of the one of the uh, examples from a few years back is about, for example, heart rate variability. So, if you have low heart rate variability, is this something related to learning or maybe health related issues? And what should what, what we're gonna do if it's uh, you know one or the other of those? So, more data, of course, it's better for us uh, in in a sense of understanding how we learn, but also brings. A lot of ethical uh, ethical questions as well. So, Linda, uh, I think this is over to you. Right? No problem. All right. So, um, departing a little bit from the traditional webinar format, we actually want to do something a little bit active here today. Um, so, I know we have people from all around different parts of the world. So, I was going to say this morning, but I know it might not be the morning time for you. Uh, but we'd really like to get your input and uh, an engagement in the discussion around the, the ethical issues that, that are raised up when we're using learning analytics just on a day-to-day -day basis. So as I said before, we, we've sort of got a lot of um, really great conversation that's happened in the field. We've got lots of policies and procedures that are starting to emerge. I won't say that they're fully formed, as Shreko said before, but we're, they're definitely on the, the agenda. Um, however, we really wanted to kind of brainstorm on the day-to-day -day basis, how, how are you using learning analytics and what are you actually doing with those uh, with that data or with those analyses? What sort of interventions are you making with your students? But then what are the privacy and ethical issues that really come from that? So the first question, what we're going to do is we're going to break you up into some breakout rooms uh, so that you've got a small group of people to have a bit of a discussion with and you can share your own experiences. Um, we do have a Google Doc and I'll give you the link to that in a moment where you can get in there and, um, and make some notes about what your group are discussing. But the first question that we'd really like you to think about as a group is, can you provide some examples of ways that you use learning analytics to enhance learning and teaching. So we're really keen, we see a lot of really great stuff in the literature where we're talking about particular systems. So a lot of what Shrek has just shown us there um, with on task and um, AccuWriter and all, Acu Writer, I should say, uh, and all those sorts of things, you know, they're, they're very specific, very tailored uses of learning analytics, which are very powerful for student learning. But I think our sort of feeling is that on the day-to-day -day basis, it's probably not quite as complex as that. It's probably a lot simpler. And, um, you know, you're using data in different ways. You may be taking that data and analysing it yourself. You may be using systems that provide you with dashboards or prompts or, or whatever the, the sort of way that that's designed. And we'd really like to understand a little bit more about those sorts of uses. So the first question is sort of, what are you doing? How, can you provide those examples? The second question is what is the main rationale behind the learning analytics that you're employing in everyday practice? So I guess what we wanted to, to get to here is if we're going to look at what is ethical in terms of the use of this data for the purpose of learning analytics, we really need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. What is it you want to get out of it? Is that kind of a, a relevant and reasonable thing to be asking? Um, so again, we would like you to Work, work out what are those examples and then why are you doing that particular form of learning analytics? And thirdly, then we want to kind of get into the, the weeds, if you want to put it that way, and really start to, to unpack what are some of the potential associated ethical and privacy risks with these learning analytics scenarios. So it may be that you in your group come up with an idea of what you're doing or like you're, you're putting forward a, an example of the kind of learning analytics you're using. And then together as a group, you can brainstorm what those potential associated ethical and privacy risks are. So Shreko, if you go to the next slide, what we're going to do now is um, we'll break you out into your breakout rooms. But before we do, just very quickly, there's the link there and we'll put that in the, the um, chat as well. This will take you to a Google Doc, which I'm hoping I've set the permissions for correctly. But again, please do let us know if there are any issues. Um, this will take you to a Google Doc where we have that first page is what you see there on the screen, um, where we'll just remind you what the questions are that we're asking you. Uh, we've given you a bit of an example of what you could do as, as a response to this. And we'd like you to work in your group and to populate some tables that we've created there for you with some examples of 
the usage of learning analytics, the rationale behind that usage and the potential ethical and privacy issues. What we're going to do at the end of the group, so we'll, we'll break out probably now for about 15 minutes. Um, we'll come back together and we'll, we'll share a little bit of the experience and the conversation that's happened in those groups. So it would be really great if you could nominate a spokesperson for your group and we'll certainly jump in and out of groups as needed and uh, answer any questions or help with the discussion as we go. Um, but yeah, so if you could have a spokesperson, that would be absolutely wonderful. And when we come back together, we'll talk a little bit about what you found, maybe not so much going through exactly what you've put in your table, because obviously you'll be able to see that in the document and you'll be able to look at other groups work as well, but really to unpack some of those really key conversations that have happened around the ethical um, aspects there. I think that would probably be a really great way of, of really bringing together some of those um, those conversations. So I think that uh, Shreka and Hazel, have I missed anything? Um, if that's if that covers it all, we'll break you off into some breakout rooms now. We hope that you'll stick around and, and participate. We can. I could already see that there's a few people dropped off. Yeah, we always have that. That's when, what I was going to say. When you to go say. to breakout we rooms, <laughs> we already um, lost some of them. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, look, oh, for, for those of us in different parts of Australia, it's early in the morning. Uh, breakout rooms before ten o'clock are a little bit dangerous. Yeah, I it suppose. just doesn't work. <laughs> um, but that's okay. Well, it'd be really great to to get some um, some really robust conversation going with the people who are keen and still here with us. So um, great. I think I need to pass over to Justin and or Shreko to activate the rooms. Is that right? Sure. Yes, uh, we can do that. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording right now. Real quick. Turn cameras off or whatever. Please do what you need. Excellent. So um, can we have our spokesperson? Now, unfortunately, our spokesperson just got nominated as opposed to nominated <laughs> themselves uh, in group one. But uh, Katrina, can I throw to you just to give a very quick summary of, of what we were sort of talking about in that, that group? Sure. Um, we haven't had much chance to talk about many examples. Uh, one example that we had was from myself uh, looking at whether students had viewed specific um, videos as part of their preparation task before attending face-to-face -face, uh, sessions in uni. Um, so the rationale is to sort of check that they're actually prepared coming to classes. Um, potential ethical or privacy issues could be this could potentially influence or bias the markers when they're assessing students. But then we also had the discussion, we have always had this hunch when you're teaching that some students did not come well prepared. But now with the analytics, we just have the actual numbers and evidence, I guess, in a way. Um, yes, so, and also whether students are aware that their teachers have the ability to look at the data at this level. So like, for example, with Panoptal that my uni uses, we can see if, sorry, um, whether they had access to videos, um, the number of minutes they spent watching the video, um, how many times they watched the video. So yeah, whether students are aware of it. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, because of our time, I'm going to sort of whip through the other groups quite quickly as well. So group two, do we have a spokesperson uh, for group two? So okay. Linda, I'm happy to I'm happy to stay a bit longer to just to give them a bit more time to to chat about if you if you uh, don't mind. I mean, if we if the discussion keeps going, I'm happy to stay just a you know a bit longer. No problem. Thanks for that, Shaco. Um, great. So do we have a spokesperson from group two? I think that's me. Um, that's you, Mark. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Um, <laughs> And look, we, we did discuss a few things. Um, uh, we, we brought up that it wasn't just about, I mean, we do analyze, uh, a few of us analyzed um, how pages are used, what pages were viewed, um, and, and mostly in regards to student progression, um, seeing how the students are progressing, et cetera. Um, we, we came to the conclusion that was an indicator not a, a final thing, if you know what I mean. Um, and um, Miles talked about the fact that how the, it was used to send out messages, what we call intelligent agents, um, messages to, to students who weren't doing so well as well. So we certainly looked at that. The other, the, the flip side of it is we also looked at the fact that uh, some of the data is used from at a meta level. 
So to look at course reviews, to look at um, how the courses are uh, succeeding. So it's it, we've taken the, the students a bit out of the equation there. So it's looking at how to improve the course for students, but not necessarily looking at exact, you know, exact students. It's the, the meta level. Um, again, each of these has it, their issues because you, you, you have to look at the context and some courses um, uh, 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 you know, students need to participate and engage really to and engage every day. Other courses, um, we don't, you know, there's no care. <laughs> they, once they get to it, they get to it. So that's, you needed that extra bit of context to make the data useful. Um, yeah. We were just getting onto the point that, of course, the data has been skewed in the last. 18 months because of the, the patterns of student behaviour <laughs> have changed dramatically. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a really good point. Um, you know, there's a lot of systems that were built, uh, algorithms that were, and models that were, were made, um, and are they still relevant in the, the, con the current context or the slightly changed context? So that's a really good point, actually. Uh, fantastic. So uh, breakout. And, uh, can three. I just add one? Oh, yes, go add for it, yeah. One more here from room two, uh, I just talk yeah. about the teacher enter the data. For Thank example, you. the feedback they provided to students was the mostly uh, commonly used feedback that may indicate uh, the gap in their teaching or maybe something they want to address in the next coming up tutorial or maybe lecture. So that's kind of useful as well. Again, privacy issue, like you don't show students name, maybe even teacher's name <laughs> or marker's yeah. name. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's a that's a really good point. We we had a staff member at our institution if, um, a few, well, actually, eighteen months ago, uh, write a letter to to the learning analytics people in in the institution to say, as a teacher, what do you track with me, and what do you do with that data, and how does that impact my employment, and how does that impact my we call it YPD, our yearly professional development planning, um, because we do talk about this a lot with the students. Well, when we don't talk about it with a lot with the students, that's the problem. But we talk about it a lot in terms of what we do with student data. But we often don't talk about what we do with uh, educator data or people who are in the system for whatever reasons. Fantastic. Uh, group three, can we have a quick update from your spokesperson? Uh, Penny, may I ask you to? <laughs> we yes. cut you off. <laughs> I think oh, thanks, you, can see, yep. you, you can see what we talked about in the Google Doc. Mm -hmm. I thought the most interesting, several several interesting points. One isn't in the Google Doc, Treco, which is uh, Sylvie mentioned. Um, I think the integration of external, so, you know, the enormous ecosystem. So, for example, studiosity is a big thing in our first year's life at the moment. So what, yeah. you know, getting clarity around the, the passage of data, the integration of data. Um, and what teachers hear about from those external services. But Stuart's point was very uh, salient about um, making the data available to students so that both the students and the teacher have the same information if the students argue about their participation in the course, that they know at least as much as the teacher or the institution does about their, their own activity. So I thought that was a good point. One of the funny words in our sheet is that we want to know why students aren't accessing certain parts of the learning design, certain parts of the materials and resources available. And um, again, I think it's the, it's just me, I didn't say it's the integration of, you'll need, you'll need a lot of systems to tell you why, you know, a lot of, a lot of data points mm. to tell you why something isn't happening rather than, than what, yeah. Anyway, thank, thanks, for the, thanks for the group. No, that's that's a really good point. I think that's been a, the eternal challenge of the learning analytics community is, you know, the data can only tell us part of the story. And sometimes the only other way we can get the, the other part that we need is to talk directly to the students and find out what they are doing. And we, we have the example, I know Hazel had a similar story um, from the same institution, actually, but we used to both work for the University of Wollongong. And we had a lot of students who just disappeared in the system. They just didn't seem to be doing anything at all. And different students were disappearing in different weeks 
but they literally just weren't logging in. They weren't accessing any of the materials. It was a real concern. So we we pulled this group of students aside and said, hey, guys, what's going on? You, you look like you're missing great swamps of, of work from this particular curriculum. And they said, oh, no, we've got a study group. And so one person each week is nominated to go into the LMS, download everything, and then we put it all on a Google Drive and we share it that way. Um, so, of course, we looked. it looked like the students weren't engaged, but actually they were probably more engaged than some of their peers because not only were they sharing this information, but they were meeting on a regular basis, discussing it, you know, running their own little um, group activities, problem-based learning. Um, so, yeah, it, it really does become dangerous when you do start to make certain decisions on the basis of that data um, that could actually be detrimental to, to student learning. Um, great. So there's some really interesting concepts there. I mean, the one, the rabbit hole that group one started to go down at the end there was things around eye tracking and, uh, you know, really going to, I, I suppose it was probably moving away a little bit from our day-to-day -day mandate, um, but maybe it is day-to-day -day in certain areas and we were saying that in certain um, you know, in certain schools and in certain countries, you know, those sorts of things are, are happening a lot more frequently. And, and of course, that really does open up an ethical minefield of, of um, issues that, that can arise. So I just, I guess I want to throw it back to Shreko and Hazel as well, just to say from, from your observation of the conversations um, going on in your groups, what are the sort of things that, that um, or I guess, where do we go next in, in some ways? What, what do we want to... Um, sort of talk about with the community going forward, just based on the very short, and I do realise it was very short and compact conversation that we've just had. Yeah, um, one thing that I found interesting, and it wasn't specifically said, but it was a vibe that I was picking up, that a lot of the conversations were around, what are we doing as teachers, as an institution? What's happening with the courses that are enabling students? So we're actually, I think this is a step forward that it used to be that everything, what are the students doing? Why aren't the students doing this, et cetera? But the conversations are now, what are we doing or what aren't we doing to allow students to have the best experience? And I think mm. by taking that, that different route, um, that that might change the conversations and also change a bit of this ethical thing because it's not so much now about the students, it's about what we're doing. So I, I see that as a positive. I don't know where mm. we go with it, but um, I see that as a positive change in the way we're thinking about the analytics. And going back to the original definition, you know, it's about students and their learning environments. The learning environments are becoming much more important rather yeah. than just the students and how we improve those learning yeah. environments. No, that's a really good point, Hazel. Um, I guess just because we are at the hour or just a little bit over the hour, just for, for those of you that may need to jump off to other meetings and things, I wanted to quickly bring people's attention. So today is really kind of the start of our conversation about day-to-day -day uses and ethical issues. And we really want to continue that conversation throughout some of the other activities that um, Hazel outlined at the beginning of the presentation. So the slide that Trekos has put up here is a bit of an ad for um, the next workshop that we're doing. The registrations are not open um, yet, but if you go to that, that website, and thank you, uh, Justin has put the link into the chat as well. Um, that way you can sign up to our special interest group, the Learning uh, Ask a Light Learning Analytics uh, SIG, and you can get notified of when that workshop's coming up. So we wanna, as well, digging deeper, we'll dig deeper again in the next workshop to, to really start to look at some of these ideas in a bit more detail. And then as Hazel said at the beginning, at the conference at the end of the year for Ask a Light, um, we will be sort of trying to then translate a lot of what we've been talking about through these sorts of events into some practical advice. So not, not trying to replicate what we've already done in those discussion papers and what a lot of other people have done with those frameworks, but some real day-to-day um, -day pragmatic practical advice that we can learn from the sorts of um, conversations that we're having in these particular forums. So, or fora, I believe is the, the um, plural. Anyway, I'll, I'll throw to you, Shreka. Is there anything you wanted to add as a reflection on uh, what you've seen come out of today's conversation? Uh, maybe just uh, to remind uh, everyone to uh, submit the consent form, please. We have oh, 10 yeah. <laughs> so far. So <laughs> it would be no, good no to have a few more people. But there is, uh, there's, uh, it's interesting, basically, that uh, 
with Chin, uh, learning analytics, right? And uh, looking at the previous conferences, it's obvious that things are progressing at a certain pace, right? But there, is, there seems to be a huge disbalance between research and practice, and we are not anywhere closer to bridging that gap because what, what we end up using, there are some eye trackers, right? That's fine, that's very good, that's positive, but we are still at the very basic level of use of learning analytics. So we are talking about ethical privacy issues, but I don't think we are necessarily just there, you know, there just yet, because there's still a lot of work of putting some of the learning analytics solutions in practice. And I like what, what Penny said, and we touched base, uh, a little bit on the uh, design for, for, for learning uh, the uh, Peter Goodyear uh, work in the sense that we, we need actually to design for something to happen so we would be able to measure that and build analytics around it. Uh, I, I still think that we are, uh, we are still relying too much on what's out of the box in the different learning management systems that tend to capture what's easy to capture rather than you know what you really want to. In that sense, uh, maybe the, the ethical uh, and privacy issues that we're dealing with are not as serious as they might be in in a, in a, in a coming uh, uh, you know years. So I get, I'm glad that we started this discussion. So I guess we will unpack some of those as we go ahead. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody so much for, for coming along today. Happy to open up and have a further conversation if um, if anybody would like to stick around. Um, I may have to run off to a meeting, but we'll see how we go. Um, but thanks again for your attendance. It'd be really great if you want to be involved in the conversation going forward. Um, but again, thank you also to the Learning Analytics Learning Network and to Justin and to George and others for um, inviting us along, for giving us this opportunity to speak to you all. And we really hope that this is spark some interesting thoughts and ideas in your mind and uh, that hopefully you can take these forward with your own institutions and very happy to continue the conversation um, right now if you want to keep talking or um, you know via email or, or through the the SIG itself so thanks and uh, thank you obviously to Hazel and to Shreko for their co-presentation and uh, I'm going to go and ring my mum she thinks that I'm being caught in a major earthquake so I better make sure <laughs> she's been trying to call me while we've been doing this webinar <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's one for the books and a cake in the middle of a webinar. <laughs> <laughs>